this is, this is, this is. Welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Mike Herrera. It's a lucky episode, lucky number 513. So this weekend, I'm going to be with Goldfinger in Denver, Colorado, hitting up uh, the Ska Fest in Denver. So Goldfinger, Less Than Jake, Five Iron Frenzy, Planet Smashers, going to be great. Planet Smashers. They play that song that MXPX does. Unstoppable. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to be there this weekend. Come on out and see see all the bands. It's going to be so much fun. I'm looking forward to it. And then end of the month, MXPX, two nights in Bremerton, Washington at the Admiral Theater with the Ataris. Sold out. Thank you. That's the 28th and 29th. Uh, and then Portland, Oregon, we're going to be playing with No Effects on the 30th, June 30th. That's that Sunday night after after our Bremerton shows. So come see us in Portland. And then next month, July 20th, we'll be, again, with No Effects in Denver. Back in Denver. Come see us. The last tour of No Effects. Once they're done with this year, they're done. And we'll be with them again in October. Um, I don't remember the dates. I never remember the dates. I still haven't looked them up from, like, weeks ago. <laughs> but it's sometime in October at San Pedro. Like, October 3rd or something like that. Anyway. Don't quote me on dates. Just go mxpx.com. We have merch. We have vinyl of the new album. We have vinyl of... Uh, we actually have self-titled vinyl. So our last album from 2018, we uh, repressed the vinyl because it was sold out. We have new two new variants, blue and red. You're going to love them. Go check them out if you haven't uh, already done so. All right. If you want to leave a voicemail, please do. Ladies, gentlemen, I need you to call in. Give me some good uh, topics, some crazy... Something something good, you know, uh, 360-830-6660. That's the phone number. Leave me a voicemail. You'll be on the show, okay? All right, let's get to some voicemails, speaking of them. Who's up first? Hey, my name is Hannah, and I'm from South Carolina with my dad, Josh. I have a question. What is your favorite song that you have ever performed? Hey, Mike, this is Hannah's dad, Josh, here. I recently saw you in Atlanta back in March, and I'm a few years younger than you, and self so I was glad to have the opportunity to sit in the balcony and not have to be in the pit for a change. So I was amazed at how hard y'all guys rocked out that night. It kind of reminded me of the Kobe Key song, I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. So my question is, are you working out and staying in shape? Or what? what is it that you do physically to prepare for a show? And then what do you do after a show to recover? Thanks, Mike. What a great question, Josh. And Hannah. Thanks for calling in, Hannah. So cool. I'll try to answer this question as best I can. Um, thank you, by the way. Uh, we do put a lot into those shows. We put all our energy, all our heart, all our minds into the shows. And so it takes a lot out of us, but we're, we're feeling good about it. And um, we don't, we, honestly, there's been times 20 years ago when I felt more out of shape than I do now. But let me just say, what do I do to keep in shape? What do I do to keep in in top tip top show shape? We call it show shape because uh, playing a show, you can't really work out for it in the same way. You should work out, and I'll get to that in a second. But when you're playing a show, the adrenaline hits, all the emotions, all of of uh, all the energy, everything. You know, it just hits you, and the anxiety. The nervousness, it all kind of like does a little number on your nervous system and it kind of freaks you out, it wigs you out a little bit. Sometimes in a good way, sometimes it could be too much. So preparing is really the best best way to do these shows. Um, and so, yeah, I do work out. And I got to admit, um, this year, last year and this year, I, I want to say 2023 was probably the year I worked out the, the least, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I still did, did a lot of tennis, but played tennis, but I really wasn't like on a regular routine and, and, and my body felt it. Like I, my, mentally, I was, I was getting drained quicker. 
um, really, honestly, recently in the last couple months, I've been really talking about it a lot, even on the podcast a little bit. Um, people that listen to every episode might might have noticed. Oh yeah, he's talking a little bit a little bit about wanting to get back into that. So I've gotten back into working out. I'm trying to go every day, although. For me, it's not like I'm doing this these like two hour workouts. I kind of get it in pretty quick, uh, forty five minutes tops, um, and I go and I do because I can't really run right now. I've got some arthritis in in my right knee that's been giving me some issues, but uh, I don't even know if it's arthritis. I just assume so. I'm, I'm self diagnosing in that respect, but um, I think it's probably something like that. Just just a little like. Oh, I didn't actually hurt my knee. It just hurts a little bit. So staying off the running, going towards elliptical in the gym, and then I hit weights. And and I'm taking the weights pretty easy. I'm not going heavy. Uh, I'm doing movement type stuff, stuff where, you know, like I like to do my shoulders like this. I do all the different stuff, but, um, you know, I'll lay off, you know, you know really like sore. I'll lay off certain exercises, but for the most part, I try to just do everything every day, you know, just as much as I can every day, including if, if it's not raining out, I go out and play tennis, uh, go to the gym, of course, in the morning. And then mentally, you know, I prepare for those, those shows, you know, I, I try to like sit down, visualize what we're going to do. We kind of go over it as a band as well. We go over the set list and go, all right, here's what we're going to do guys. And Tom will actually lead this Tom does this thing where he leads this like class on, okay, guys, this is how we're going to play this set. Start out with this song, goes to this, goes into here, you know, Yuri plays his drums and Mike comes in with announces the song and then I'll come in. And then we just, he just goes through every song and what we're sort of expecting in between each song, because there are different transitions that we come in and out of. Sometimes we, end the song and and don't start the next song until I announce it. And sometimes we just go right into the next song. So we have to kind of know what we're going to do because it does change every night. Now, back to the physical thing, push-ups, sit-ups, really just getting the blood pumping when you're, when you're getting ready to go on stage. Uh, I try not to go too hard, um, just enough to where you're just like, you're ready to go on a, on a go do a workout and that's to me i'm ready to go do a show because a show really is a workout it's probably one of the best workouts i've i've really had in my life these days but um i i still love the physical aspect of these shows and i love that i need to stay active and stay moving to pull off what we do it just ensures that you know it's just it makes it it's not a cakewalk it's something i have to really try to do and, and I think we all kind of feel that way, all the band guys, you know, we're all, we can all do the shows, but to push even harder, you know, you're really pushing yourself physically, mentally, lyrically, you know, I'm trying to like remember all these lyrics, I'm trying to think of, okay, what's coming next, do I need to talk next, am I, and then things strike you in the moment as well, so, you know, the show isn't always cookie cutter, this, 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 this things happen where you react to them and the show can go over here for a second and then come back. So I love it when those things happen because we've been a band for so long. When they happen, they're, they're, they're really little gifts. It's like take, you know, picking an apple off the tree and taking a bite because you don't know what you're going to get. Sometimes it's sweet and juicy. Sometimes it's bitter and sour and, and, and it doesn't work. But for the most part, uh, we've been having amazing shows, honestly. Uh, this, this whole year, every show's been great. Um, we, we haven't had near, I don't even want to talk about it. Knock on wood. Where's the wood? Uh, we haven't had near the technical dip difficulties that, that we had had last year. And I think it's just because you fix as you go, you fix this, you fix this, you fix this. And that allows you to have a little less anxiety too when you get out on stage. But a little bit of nervous is good. A little bit of anxiety is good. It kind of gets you pumped up. And then I just use that adrenaline. I use that adrenaline almost like a pre-workout where it just gets you pumped and you're just like a little itchy and you're ready to you're ready to stick and move. Well, that's, that's pre-show. I mean, we're all like uh, ready to go, like a boxer. Um, 
but really it doesn't it doesn't hit until I don't really get comfortable until like third, fourth, fifth song probably. Fifth song's really where I'm like, okay, I'm not out of breath anymore. Like right at first, I get a little out of breath for the first couple songs. Um, I don't know why. I think it's just because I'm acclimating to the pace of everything. Um, yeah, it is wild. It's like we're going live. There's no redos, do-overs. This is it. This is live and anything could happen. And that's part of why it's so nerve wracking and, and, and so exciting, you know? And I think it's exciting for the audience too. I love seeing live shows as an audience member. I mean, it's live. So, you know, just know that we play everything live. We don't have tracks. We don't have pre-recorded anything. Um, not that bands that do aren't also playing live. They are playing live, but, um, but sometimes it can be like even crazier if you don't have this set thing, you know, cause we're, we're just moving as a band together and we got to pay attention. I got to pay attention to what Tom does. He's on a certain part and then I have to sing to make that part happen. And then the whole band will come in. Things like that happen all the time. But, um, yes, physically though, just work out whatever works for you. I think doing a little bit of, weightlifting, something cardio wise. It doesn't matter what, honestly, I love playing tennis because I don't know. I have a buddy that plays tennis. We have tennis courts down the street from my house. Uh, we don't play all year round because it does rain a lot, but it's something to look forward to during the nice seasons. You know, the, the summer of course, but spring, fall, when it's nicer, we get out there and move. Uh, it's something that's like, it's almost like it doesn't feel like I'm actually working out. It feels like I'm just having fun and that's what you need to do to, to find, you know, a really good workout and then just be consistent. I think the most important thing of anything is not how hard you work out. And of course you should work out hard, but it's being consistent. It's doing that same thing every week, every day. If you can't do it every day, three, four times a week, try to try to work out, be physical at least four times a week. I would go five days, six days if you possibly can. And just go lighter on some of the days and go heavy on just a couple days and then your 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 body can recover. And you know, we have to do this when we're young, we have to do this when we're old. It doesn't matter. You you just your body is a is this like meat sack that needs to be exercised. It needs practice at what it's doing or it gets it gets rusty. Just like when I'm not singing a song, I'll forget all the lyrics. Uh, if it's a, if it's a song that I hadn't done hundreds, hundreds of times, I'll forget the lyrics a couple, you know, a month later. Um, and that's just, we need that practice. We just need that. So I'm no expert on physical, you know, physical and mental well being, <laughs> to be honest, but, but I feel like what works for me is being consistent with my workout routine getting it done early. If you're somebody that likes to procrastinate, get it done early so that it's just already done and you can't talk yourself out of it. And then food, food is a huge thing. Uh, if you can't control your, your portions and how much you eat, try to control what it is you're eating and when you're eating. So you can find things that are healthier that you could eat a lot of, and it's not going to put a lot of weight on. It's not going to drag it down. And you can also eat in a smaller window of time. So right now I eat, and this is going to change, but right now I've been, uh, I've been eating like from noon to let's say a average 6.30. 6.30, I'm usually done eating dinner. And, um, and I've just been doing that just to give my body a little break, intermittent fasting. And, and it's not hardcore. It's like maybe 18 hours, usually usually more like 16 hours, you know, on, on the safe side. But I'm just doing that because I'm seeing if it makes a difference in how I feel. I'm experimenting and I've been and experimenting with not eating cereal. I know that's not good for you. So I love cereal. And so I'm trying not to eat it as often. Uh, and, and I've honestly felt better, but I don't know if it's the cereal or if it's the ibuprofen I took, or if it's, you know, the water I've been drinking. So it takes longer, but I've definitely already noticed whenever I take something away from my diet, I'll notice within a couple of days, whenever I start working out, 
um, I'll notice within a couple days, if not one day, uh, the difference. And it's not always a great difference. You know, it's, at first you feel worse, but uh, you get you push through that, and then you start to feel you start to feel more energetic, more open. Uh, they say, you know, if you have a problem with your knee or with your some some sort of part of your body that's breaking down lift weights on the other parts of your body and that will help strengthen the scaffolding that is your structure and if you're stronger in general the part that's bothering you like say my knee my right knee that that's going to become stronger too and honestly i I know that that's been that's been a thing for a long time. I'm not making this up. I was told this, you know. I was given this these instructions by a doctor, but um, but it is true. I mean, it really is true because I'm I've been lifting and I'm like, wow, I already feel better just by lifting weights. And I've been lifting weights throughout this year. Don't get me wrong, but I haven't been I hadn't been doing it with a proper routine. And, and it really does make a big difference if you do it properly. Instead of just going through the motions, I was just doing it at home in the kitchen, you know, like or at the studio in between things, which is cool. Like if that's all you can do, go for it. But I, I, you know, I don't think that I don't think that I don't think that I was getting the job done. Is what I'm trying to say. I I, I knew I wasn't getting the job done. And, and as soon as I decided I'm going to really, I'm going to really make an effort at getting back in shape in better shape than I already was. I was, it's not like I was a slobber in bad shape, but it just wasn't as toned. Now I'm getting more toned. You're going to see it. I mean, it's going to be a slow change of course, but uh, you know, just keep that routine rolling and you can't help but change a little bit. That's it. All right. Let's get to the next episode, or sorry, not not episode, get the next voicemail. Here we go. Hey, Mike, it's your attorney, Dan, from Ohio. Uh, enjoyed this week's episode. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, for a long time, one of the big highlights for you was that you had, uh, that MX Biggs had appeared in that Super Bowl commercial, but now you've done other big, exciting things that have kind of replaced that. So I was hoping maybe you could share some of the highlights from over the years, like big things. Maybe like the first time that you had something that you were like, oh, shit, we've really made it. Uh, and then, you know, some of the things since the Super Bowl commercial that are memorable to you so that we can all uh, celebrate that. We love to see you in, and the band hitting these high points and, and you know, succeeding and, and having these great moments because we all love you and support you and, and want you to, you know, that, to have these things. And, and we want to, you know, see you happy because you make us happy all the time. Thanks, man. Talk to you later. Thanks, Attorney Dan. You're the best. Um, yeah, I was talking about Super Bowl a couple episodes back, Super Bowl commercial that we did and the experience we had. Um, let me think of a few other things. Um, before the Super Bowl commercial, we played with the Sex Pistols in – it was it was Bumper Shoot, and it was the biggest show we had done to date. It was a huge – you know, it was a stadium, a, a football stadium. That, that's where we played. And we opened for the Sex Pistols. It's funny because we actually opened for the Sex Pistols who also happened to have Goldfinger on tour with them. Goldfinger was their opener. Stabbing Westward couldn't make the show. So Goldfinger moved up a slot and we got to open. That's how I first met Goldfinger. Um, so that for a long time was like our claim to fame was like we played for the Sex Pistols. It was like, you know, what everybody mentioned when they wrote an article about us. And then, uh, I mean, there was a bunch of other things that we did, but fast forward, fast forward, here we are, you know, well, not to now. Fast forward to that Super Bowl commercial in 20, 2008 or whatever it was, 2006. I don't even remember. <laughs> it was a couple of weeks ago we talked about it, but I don't even remember the, the year it was. But And then that was sort of like, okay, that was huge. Um, and so since then, what has been... A big highlight for us, I would say the biggest would be Let's Ride becoming our biggest song on streaming, um, bigger than really everything, um, even Punk Rock Show. And I'm not saying that more people have listened to Let's Ride than Punk Rock Show in the history of the songs, but 
right now more people listen to Let's Ride than they do Punk Rock Show. That happening, um, and a lot of things happening around Let's Ride was huge. Let's Ride being on the Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 reissue, the 2020 version, being on the soundtrack, being on the game, being able to play that video game in all its glory and have my kids hear an MXPX song while they're skating. Oh, I'm Tony Hawk. I'm Steve Caballero. It's like, it's amazing. It's, it's, that was a huge thing. That was another Super Bowl moment for us. Let's Ride being placed on Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Um, there were some other things, but that's the biggest. That's for me. And, and I know I, it's easy for me to forget a lot of, a lot of details along the way, a lot of other things that we've done, um, you know, but I feel like that one was pretty huge and it's going to live on for a long time. Um, we, you know, we have our own beer, a few different styles of our own beer, which is, has been cool to, to be part of, um, with Silver City Brewery, um, you know, but I think the thing that, that I'm sort of, the criteria I'm using for these moments for MXPX are bigger than MXPX moments. They're, they're moments where it's not just big for MXPX, it's big for everyone there. And so to be part of a Super Bowl commercial and to have a punk rock band play on a Super Bowl commercial was, was amazing for so many kids when they saw that. They're like, I can't even believe that MXPX is on TV right now. What? That was huge. It, it went outside of what MXPX was at the time and, and really is. Uh, and I think Tony Hawk Pro Skater does the same kind of thing where we, of course, it's amazing for MXPX, for our fans, for our community, but it's, it, it reaches so much further than even just punk rock. Tony Hawk Pro Skater reaches the skateboarding community. It reaches the mainstream video gaming community. It reaches EA Sports community. I mean, there's all these little niches that are actually b much bigger than even MXPX and punk rock is. Punk rock is, is a pretty small little community over here. Um, when you put it up against some of the other bigger communities. Um, but, you know, that's it's part of why we love what we do. You know, we're... Uh, we're we're very lucky to have experienced all these amazing amazing events you know that we've been part of whether it was like you know getting to play with sex pistols early on uh we've played all these other shows you know along the way played with um almost any band you can think of that's in the rock and punk genre and just so much going on what's up tom thomas Nesky's here maybe he'll uh show up i'm doing my podcast <laughs> Want to come say hi? Maybe he'll come say hi. What's up? Are you talking to yourself? Talking to myself. All right. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm going all blurry if I go back. Yeah, if you go back, you blur yeah, up. Yeah. Uh, so I got the speaker done. I'm going to paint probably tomorrow. I'll be here tomorrow, too. Okay, so tomorrow we'll do a work day. Yeah. Cool. You got a quick turnaround or? No. No? no All right. Yeah. I'll see you in a minute. All right. That's Tom. We're going to do a couple more voicemails and then uh, then we'll be out of here. Hey, Mike. This is Dan Larry calling. Uh, I'm calling about the call, call to all the listeners. It was actually, I hadn't listened to the podcast yet. And then I get a message from Dan Starrett saying, you're calling in, right? Because you probably... Seen, he was right because you've probably seen. I know you've seen posts I've done from MSPX memes getting hot under the collar about Ska. So I get like overly defensive about Ska, which is why that book, Defensive Ska, that came out recently was right up my alley. Anyway, you're really you're kind of like right there with mentioning that the upstrokes are what makes this what makes Ska Ska. It's not the horns. It's not any of the other stuff you mentioned. But you kind of put the cart before the horse because it's not the upstroke specifically that makes ska ska, it is the offbeat. It's the one and two and three and four and uh, putting yeah. the I agree. guitar stroke on that and is what makes it ska. Mm -hmm. Because other music has upstrokes. Rockabilly has upstrokes. Polka has upstrokes. But rockabilly and polka might be, you can 
maybe mix those with ska a little bit, but those are separate genres. It's the offbeat, one and two and three and four. And anything else on top of that, horns, keyboards, adding in a punk breakdown, anything else of that is just bells and whistles on top of that one defining fact about ska. Then there's probably the second most important thing is the walking bass line. Um, I mean, that's become less important, like you mentioned, with ska punk and the whole third wave thing. Uh, the other thing is that the upstroke is also kind of a misnomer because traditional ska, wrapping around, around this, most people don't realize this, traditional ska, Jamaican ska from the 60s, downstroke. On the offbeat, on the and, one and two and three, but it was a downstroke. And the only reason we have upstrokes in ska today is because it kept getting faster. It's because by the 90s, uh, you know, Fishbone, Goldfinger, uh, all the skank and pickle, Operation Ivy, they get so fast that it's mechanically impossible to play a downstroke ska guitar, which is what had been happening up until then. So that's why it's all upstrokes. Um, I mean, I could keep going, but I'm sure I'm almost done with that three-minute limit. The other thing is, like, you don't even need guitar to be playing ska. As long as you're emphasizing that offbeat, it's already ska music. A lot of other bands have piano. And they use the piano as the leading ska instrument. It's the, you know, you're doing the off with it with the staccato piano strike. Uh, there's like digital, like chiptune ska band. Dub Mood has an album called Atari Ska. That's not a guitar, but it's still doing ska. Um, keyboard. There's even like, uh, some early ska, like, uh, Last Train, not Last Train, Train to Skaville by the Ethiopians. You listen to that song, it's not even really an upstroke or a downstroke. It's kind of like a, Oh, he got cut off, but he called back. So I'm going to play the second part, and then we'll get right into it, Dan. I knew I was getting time greedy. I knew I should have ended when I had a good out there, but you got it. Anyway, uh, offbeat. That's the number one thing that makes ska ska. I think the second most important thing is the walking bass line in traditional ska. Uh, maybe that's become less important now that the guitar is lead. The guitar can lead more melodic things. That's the last thing I want to mention <laughs> is that traditional ska, the leading melodic instrument is the bass line. Jamaican ska, the guitar is part of the rhythm section. The drums and the guitar are the rhythm section. And the melodic lead is the bass and the vocals and then the horns when there's usually horns or the keyboard or the organ if there's those things. So then you start mixing together punk and rock in England in the 70s and you put in even more fast punk in the 80s and the 90s in America, and now the guitar can go back and forth between being a rhythm instrument and sort of a melodic lead, especially when you break down in between sort of style parts and punk parts. But, um, you know, those are the two, those are the most important thing, offbeat. Second most important thing, but not too important nowadays, wobby bass line. Everything else, bells and whistles. Just, you can be one person on a piano and you can play style if you want to, like and with no other instruments, no other band members. Uh, should I just keep going until I run out of time again? No, I'm going to hang up now. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks for the call. And I love this. All right. You know, I, I agree with you off beats. And I actually talked to a few people and they all said off beats. And, um, and Tom Chichilla even said, he was like, aside from the off beats, it's not just playing off beats. It's also the groove of that because so many people are terrible at playing ska even people in ska bands. So uh, it's not something you can just easily do, but when you get that groove, mm, mm, that's that's ska guitar right there. It's ska. And um, yeah, I mean, you can do it on the organ, piano, all that. The most important thing, and I agree with you, upbeats. Um, and that's the thing. It's like, the walking bass line does, does like add to it, but it, it, there's obviously band plenty of ska songs that don't have a walking bass line it doesn't have to like it could but i love all the perspective that you gave us uh the history the rich history of ska and reggae and and punk um i love it all i really do and uh i appreciate you guys for being part of it too so thanks for listening uh we're gonna leave it there we'll get back to it next week appreciate you guys if you're in Denver this weekend, I'll see you at the Scoff Fest. Let's do some upstrokes together. I'll do some walking bass lines. You do some upstrokes. We'll have a good time. All right. Before we go, shout out to Bob McKnight. Go check out mxpx.com if you haven't already done so. You can always listen to us 
Wherever you listen to music, check out our new album, Find a Way Home. All right, I'm done. Peace. Thank you so much. Have a great night.